Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series, Smarter Together. Today's webinar is brought to you by Georgia Tech Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation Group and is the eighth webinar in our series that discusses emerging issues in our communities and brings you expert voices on those topics. My name is Greg McCormick. I'm the director of the Georgia Smart Communities Challenge, a grant program offered through the Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation Team. The grant's available to local governments in Georgia to pursue pilot and planning studies in smart cities technology. Today's webinar is titled Community Insights, Insight Community Action, and we have two presenters today. They're Dr. Cleo Andrus, Assistant Professor at Georgia Tech in the School of City and Regional Planning and Interactive Computing, and Tommy Pierce, Executive Director at Neighborhood Nexus. And today's webinar will be moderated by Blaine Williams, City Manager, athens Clark County Unified Government. So before we get started, uh, today's webinar, it is being recorded and will be available for you to view later. We've also made the slides available for download on our website. Both can be accessed through the media area of our news and events tab on our website. I also wanna mention that you can ask questions using the Q&A section on the right side of your screen. Please use that area to submit questions at any time. And after the presenters finish their presentations, we'll go into a panel discussions where they answer your questions. So again, I'd like to welcome you all to today's Smarter Together webinar. And now to get us started, I'd like to welcome Blaine Williams. Well, thank you, Greg. And I appreciate uh, the invitation here and an honor to be uh, sharing this platform with um, our two distinguished presenters today, Dr. Andrus and Tommy Pierce. Um, and I wanna just, just spend a second and, and reflect on the purpose of, of the, the webinar series. And that is that, you know, we, we look beyond this immediate crisis uh, I think for many of us that work in or are, are fortunate to work in the organizations that we do, uh, we've been very accustomed to spending good time in quadrant two. And if you're familiar with that paradigm, that is where we work on things that are important but are not urgent and we get ahead of things. And of course, this crisis uh, more recently has really caused us to get out of quadrant two and deal with the immediate. And um, I want to applaud the intent of this as, at looking ahead, uh, bringing research to the table, building strong community partnerships, and moving ahead towards the next stage of innovation, technology, and, gro and growth. And, and I want to thank Georgia Tech for that. I also, a uh, point of uh, personal privilege here, coming from Athens, something that's very important to us and I think resonates with the Smarter Together intent, and that is the Athenian Oath. And for all of us, uh, and, and uh, the last clause of that Athenian oath says, thus in all these ways we will transmit this city not only, not less, but greater and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. And I think that uh, for me really resonated with what this uh, webinar series is doing, and I'm pleased to be a part of this. Today's webinar uh, is titled Community Insights Insight Community Action. And it's specifically about community data, how critical it is, a piece of our public infrastructure. And if used well, it should align our programs and policies to community needs. And it becomes more critical in understanding our citizens when our physical movements and interactions are limited. Dr. Cleo Maria Andrus will share her analysis on spatial networks uh, and friendly cities. And Tommy Pierce will follow and show us how Neighborhood Nexus leverages community data to help mission-driven organizations ask the right questions, use the best data, tell compelling stories, and make informed decisions. So I wanna get right to that. I'm excited to hear uh, what these two have to share with us and of course your questions uh, after that. And so I wanna first introduce Dr. Cleo Maria Andrus, Assistant Professor School of the City and Regional Planning and Interactive Computing for Georgia Tech, and she will lead us off this afternoon. Dr. Andrus. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, really happy to be here. I wanna thank you know Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation and Greg and Christy and especially Deborah Lamb for organizing. Um, and I'm really happy to be involved with this initiative. It's already helped facilitate ties with uh, the city of Savannah and uh, linking academic research with some really dedicated, talented practitioners. So I really find a lot of value in this program and want to say thanks. 
Today, uh, my topic is going to be Beyond Demographics, Data on Social Life and Social Capital. So originally, I was going to talk about some more network graph theory types of things, but given the situation that has evolved over the few weeks with, upco with uh, COVID, I thought that this was going to be a little more appropriate. Next slide. All right, so the problem I want to address today is that demographic data typically do not tell us about personal relationships. And I'm interested in studying personal relationships. Those include professional relationships, relationships between a mother and the son, any type of friendship relationships, romantic relationships, et cetera. If we had more data on the, this, um, it would help us describe infrastructure usage and the value of infrastructure. It would help us measure vulnerability, which is really important right now. And it would help us address loneliness which is also becoming a serious issue in today's society. So already data can sort of tell us a little bit about uh, interpersonal relationships and loneliness. Here's an example of a map uh, colored in Manhattan in New York, colored by the number or the percentage of households that have only one person living there. So percentage of single person households. And they are really, really concentrated. You can see a lot in lower Manhattan, and then you see very few of them on the periphery. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of personal relationships. But in the COVID situation, a lot of those people in the red areas left. You know, they might be in the Hamptons, they might be elsewhere with friends. So it doesn't give us a great, a great picture. All right, next slide. Loneliness is a huge issue, and it was a huge issue before COVID as well. Uh, these are three different articles about it. And also, Great Britain has, uh, has appointed a minister of loneliness, uh, specifically a couple of years ago. So health officials, government officials are really paying attention to this problem, especially among the elderly. Next slide. Oh, yes. That is also that is also a thing, consumerism. All right, so I'm a GIS analyst, and my research is on representing different phenomena in geographic space. So how can we use different data sets? So I break these down into different groups on how to represent personal relationships. One group is like a line, just a dyadic relationship between two people, maybe between their households. Uh, another is points of interest in institutions, so data on POIs, whether that POI is a hospital, a library, a bookstore, et cetera. Uh, social networks, which is actually one of my specialties. Um, so when we have networks of people who are joined together and we know that, like how do those networks actually play out in geographic space? Next, administrative units. So what kinds of data we can put on existing administrative units, like census tracts, counties, et cetera, that give us a better idea of relationships than just demographics. And then the other two are regions, which are what kind of markets do relationships actually have, and then raster data, which is a little bit more in terms of spatial interaction. So next, please. The first one I'm going to talk about is points of interest. Next, please. I'm going to give two example studies that were done on points of interest. The first study, the goal was to understand how restaurants were used to help different relationships. This study used big data, as the other one will as well. So a corpus of 361,000 geolocated re restaurant reviews were provided, and they were provided for a few cities based on a challenge from Yelp. So we use text mining to pick out keywords. Here's a, just a couple, boyfriend, girlfriend, date, kids, anniversary, family, husband, wife, et cetera. And we wanted to find neighborhood hotspots for each keyword. So if these words came up in the restaurant review, we assigned those that to the point where the restaurant was, and we wanted to see if they were used for different purposes. Next slide. So here are some answers from Pittsburgh. Uh, we found out that when certain words were used, they popped up in different places in the city. For example, anniversary and romantic, those places popped up really highly for restaurants that had a really beautiful view because they were on the cliff. And those were, those were important places for these types of things. 
when you had keywords like children, for example, another type of hotspot emerge. Next one. Uh, in Phoenix, we saw that date night, again, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, intimate, et cetera, they had special pinpoints where these occurred, so where the restaurants were serving these needs versus places where we saw family and children, they were more spread out. And then the same thing happened for uh, Las Vegas. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, so certain things were very confined to the Las Vegas Strip. So when we had these types of keywords pop up, they were very, very confined when we, we went to the strip. But when you found out what was good for family and what was good for children, those were in different places. So that's one way we can understand points of interest as attached to the types of relationships that they help. Next slide, please. All right, the next, the next example is another example that is in progress, and that is helping us understand which types of points of interest support which types of relationships. So this is just a schematic of a small town in Pennsylvania, and the different points of interest here, which are represented as building footprints, are classified by what types of relationships they might be helping. And this is just a broad overall idea before we plugged in data. So for example, an art museum, bed and breakfast might be really important for tourist relationships. Uh, the Veterans Administration, the Elks Lodge, et cetera, might be important for exclusive relationships. Or you could take that to another type of category, like perhaps there are certain societies that are focused towards male relationships, or you could make veterans relationships their own type of category. So this is a way to actually inventory infrastructure based on who it's helping. And so if it goes away, or if there's, you know, if they're wanting to take it out, you'll know who might be affected by this and what, and you can say, you know, what other types of infrastructure can we put in place to replace the places that were lost because of this. Uh, next slide, please. So we uh, we have scraped some Twitter data and some Reddit data to give a little bit of a proof of concept of this. Again, this research is still in progress. But we wanted to find tweets and Reddit posts where we had a type of relationship and a place. So in the post that they gave that, you know, I went to an escape room with my coworkers and it was great. So this table, table one here, shows the category of the point of interest and the number of times that the POI was associated with different types of relationships. So for example, the zoo was associated with an elderly and child relationship 24 times in our study. A casino uh, was associated sometimes with taking, you know, your parents there, sometimes with taking uh, coworkers there, uh, sometimes with romantic relationship, but most often with friends. We have a lot of, of friends, friend types of things here. But you can also see that um, that children benefit from some of these more than others, or that uh, romantic relationships, you know, really use coffee shops. We think of coffee shops maybe for work or something, but they're really important for facilitating other types of ties. And then at the bottom is just some more data that we are looking at in terms of what types of points of interest help different relationships. I feel like I'm saying that a lot. I hope I'm driving that home. So friendships, uh, the escape room came up very high for those. Or friendships, the bowling alley came up very high for those. So we're really tying relationships to infrastructure here. Okay, next slide. So those, what I just told you about, were two different ways to help enrich point of interest data, POI data, which again, you can get from OpenStreetMap, you can get from Google API, you can get from a lot of different places. And uh, how we can enrich that POI data with information about the types of relationships that use that POI. So next I'm gonna move on to administrative units. So from de traditional demographics to social capital indicators. And now some of our listeners and participants today might know more about social capital indicators than I do because you might use it in your communities. But I'm just gonna give a broad overview for people who are interested in this. So here's an example of how census data can be used to take a look at relationships. This is the count these are counties where grandparents are the primary caretaker of children in the county. And what we see here is that uh, Native American populations 
tend to have very high percentages of these. And some of the more African-American populations in the South tend to have high um, percentages of these as well. In addition, we saw that more, more and more of these were popping up over time in Appalachia, and we think that that is due to the opioid uh, crisis there. So this is one example of leveraging census data to look at relationships. Next slide. But there's a lot of other ways besides census data. So this is a big project from the U.S. Senate, the Geography of Social Capital in America, and all the links are available to you through the PowerPoint that's online. This one really took into account some more creative types of things. Uh, they looked at more psychological factors. For example, you know, how are children doing? Have they reported, have there been violence near them, et cetera? Infrastructure availability, so saying like, do you have some sort of library nearby? Do you have golf courses nearby, et cetera? And that was a prevailing way of measuring social capital before this. What kinds of POIs do you have near you? But it doesn't, having a golf course nearby you doesn't necessarily translate to social capital. You need to really connect the dots there. Um, civic engagement rates on how many people volunteer, how many people donate to charity, how many people vote. So those are incorporated in here. Uh, next slide, please. And here's just a slew of more things. The list goes on and on. So what this project did is it created a social capital index by county that took in this big set of information and really out came output an index for every place. Here are just some more of the examples of the places of the types of variables that went into these. But you need to, you need to again, draw a line there. So does, it, does the share of women ages 45 to 54 who have never been married really equate to low social capital? It's a good question. Uh, so some of these, maybe we take them with a little bit of a question mark, and some of them we take them with a little bit more of a smoking gun that social capital is present or not. Next slide, please. So another example of social capital data is from the Harvard Kennedy School, um, Robert Putnam, who wrote Bowling Alone, his group has conducted surveys in 2000 and 2006, which does seem like a long time ago now. But they also asked a bunch of these questions. So does your place of residence give you a sense of who you are? Does your religion give you a sense of who you are? They asked that traditional wallet question, you know, if you, someone dropped a wallet, would it get returned to you? So this information was especially interesting to us because it was at the zip code level. Next slide, please. So we mapped a trust indicator. This is some prior work in Rochester, New York. This is, if, if we have any GIS geeks out there, uh, there's certainly one in this room, but if we have any GIS geeks out there, know that these were the, the most contiguous um, set of geographic areas that we could get from this data set. So even when you see holes in here, this was good for this data set. So this is in Rochester, zip code level, and the darker green areas are where there was reported more trust. So the people reported more trust. And then the lighter areas is where people reported less trust. And we wanted to see if these correlated with POIs or population density, et cetera. And it turned out that, as you can just see clearly from this map, there was a little bit more trust in the suburban areas. Next. This is an example of the number of close friends by zip code. So these, the number that you see inside of the zip code area is actually the number of respondents. So when you see numbers in the single digits, like one, seven, two, you're know, you know that not a lot of respondents responded to this survey because it was a telephone survey. It was nationwide. It was hard to do. So because of the low sample size, this doesn't really give us a whole idea, but it is really interesting to know how many people have a number of close friends number of close friends per person. So the darker green areas here, it was at least 4.6 close friends per person. And then the lighter areas were less. And these are divided into natural breaks. We don't want to uh, divide up human into decimals. Okay, next. So other countries do this pretty well. Uh, Australia has done really, really great job of social capital inventory. Next slide. 
Uh, they have all of these different types of indicators in their social capital survey. We haven't been able to play with this data spatially yet, but they present an amazing framework for gathering social capital data in your community. Uh, so number of close relatives or friends living half an hour or less away, that is very important for health outcomes and loneliness. Another example is frequency of face-to-face -face -face contact. Clearly in today's society, that needs to be changed a little bit, but it's still a good indicator of social capital. Next slide. Singapore also conducts very, very uh, unique Meth conducts a very, very in-depth surveys on this. So this is an example from Singapore about how many family members, relatives, friends who are not neighbors, neighbors who are not neighbors who are friends, neighbors in general, do certain people report having. So they broke it down into the size of your household, this, not the size of your household, the, the size of your home, how many bedrooms your house has, basically. And this shows that for somebody who lives in a five-room flat, which is how they do it in Singapore, um, they have at least seven, about seven close family members. They have about 19 relatives. They have friends who are not neighbors. They listed all the different numbers of friends. So this is the size of the social network. And they have this at the household level. But of course, for privacy reasons, that might not be available to all of us. All right, I'm gonna try to finish up here pretty quick. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm advocating for are some questions that really get to the heart of how people are doing. How, what kind of support they have, what kinds of things that we can't measure very well, what kind of benefits do they have? And the health community has seemed to have done this very well. So this is the MOS survey by Rand. Next slide. Uh, and they asked some really great questions on here. Emotional, informational support. You know, someone you can count on to listen to you when you need to talk. Someone whose advice you really want. Tangible support. Someone to help you if you're confined to a bed. Affectionate support. Someone who shows you love and affection, et cetera. It would be really cool to have this data and link it to what we've done with the built environment to have some of these outcomes. And it would be really cool to have these data to understand what kinds of neighborhoods might need more infrastructure and might need intervention to help people uh, have better livelihoods. Next. Um, I'm gonna skip through this for a time. So we'll just keep going, keep going. Yay, keep going. They're online, keep going. All right, I'm just gonna conclude here. I have shown a few examples of geographic data that represent information about relationships. I showed some at the POI level, so how relationships use POIs, and I've shown a couple at the administrative district level, so how social capital or social behavior is represented. I encourage surveys and creative uses of big data to help us enrich community data with these approaches. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cleo. I appreciate that presentation, very informative. I wanna remind all our uh, folks that are, are with us today, uh, over to your right on the Blue Jeans Network uh, platform, you can find the chat box, the event chat, uh, and follow that for comments during the presentation. And then a little lower on the right-hand corner, you'll see a box that says Q&A. And we'd love to hear your questions. Uh, any that you have for Cleo, please send those in. And I'm gonna to introduce Tommy Pierce, who's the Executive Director of Neighborhood Nexus. He's been there about a year now and brings uh, some broad experience in nonprofit uh, nonprofits to us today. And Tommy, glad to hear your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, uh, Smart Cities Group, and especially Deborah Lamb, who's one of our amazing board members. So thanks for the invite. Um, I, I wanna take a few minutes to talk a little bit about our organization, um, how we think about data and how we use it. Um, and then I'm going to take a risk and try to show y'all something in real time. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, next slide, please. I'm trying to figure out where to quick, click. So um, the, the purpose of our organization is we're trying to build a culture of data-driven decision-making uh, in Metro Atlanta organizations and, and really across the state of Georgia. Um, so we focus primarily on, on nonprofits, uh, community organizations, local governments, and, and really trying to help them make those critical decisions strategically. Um, Neighborhood Nexus is comprised of a partnership between the Atlanta Regional Commission, which is where we're physically housed and staffed, 
the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, who runs our back office stuff, they're our fiscal agent, the Metro Atlanta Chamber, and United Way of, of Greater Atlanta. So that really places us at the, at the center, the intersection of philanthropy and human services and local government, uh, the, uh, regional planning, uh, in, in the business community. Uh, we're also the local affiliate of the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which is housed at Urban Institute. So we have, we have this great national network to kind of learn from. Uh, next slide, please. You know, so we think we talk about community data and what that means, and then you see that as a uh, demographic, economic, um, family composition, a lot of the stuff you see in the census, um, in, the, in the American Community Survey, you also see um, sort of community-wide um, public health uh, data, and and you know right now everyone's watching COVID uh, and, and and the data that's coming out of DPH and what that looks like. Um, you know, without all of that, organizations specifically, which is kind of how we think about it, are are kind of missing would be missing out on on information that would tell them about the communities that they're serving. So um, you might leave unfilled gaps because you just didn't recognize that there was an issue. Um, you might uh, misalign your services. You know, if you're trying to figure out what services to provide to your community, or if you already provide a specific set of services, what communities need those, right? And then at the end of the day, um, we're really wasting funds and resources because we could have been tweaking our programs to make them stronger. Um, we're also missing out on the opportunity to build better cases for our for support to get grant money to actually do the work. Uh, next slide, please. The way we think about it, this is kind of four steps. And, and Blaine mentioned this at the beginning because um, it was in my bio, but we, we, we go through kind of a, a very simplified version of, I guess, the scientific method, right? Asking the right questions, use the best data, tell compelling stories, and make informed decisions. We think all four of these pieces are critical. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Um, a, a few months ago, a, a really large organization came to us and said, we're doing strategic planning right now, um, and we want to know what data you have. Well, we have thousands of indicators at dozens of different geographies, we need to back that up and say, well, what questions are you trying to ask? And so, you know, for them, it was, well, we have about 30 child care centers around the metro Atlanta region. We actually want to know what's different about each of the uh, kind of constituencies or members of each of those of each of those campuses. And so that gives us a good starting point and we can kind of plot those points of interest uh, on, on a map, look at some underlying demographic data and, and kind of then uh, look at the what are the insights there, you know, um, up in Lawrenceville, you know, there's a lot more different languages spoken. There's a lot more families um, with, with more children, whereas in, in sort of South Atlanta, maybe we um, have more children, uh, more financial need. And so we might structure how or um, how the program is, uh, how the fees work or what services or what types of facilities are provided. So we, we take those insights and turn it into a narrative, and that helps them make strategic decisions in the long run. That's one example. We work with organizations, uh, you know, all the time with different issues, trying to answer different questions. Uh, next slide, please. So we do all this through kind of three distinct programs. The first called Comprehensive Access, which is really just all of this data, thousands of indicators from dozens of sources um, available on our website, always free all the time to the community, businesses, whoever wants to use it. It's just there. Um, um, so you can go and look at that. We have mapping uh, tools, we have charting tools, we have dashboards, we have a blog um, where we kind of do the deep, a few deep dives. So if you don't know where to start, go to the blog and kind of search aging or disability or uh, race. And, and we'll, we'll, we've already done a lot of deep dives for you, right? And it gives you a good starting point. Uh, the second is custom insights. So we actually do a lot of, uh, I guess, consulting work. So organizations will come to us. You can see some of them listed there. And we'll build them a dashboard or help them just think about data or be a partner through their collective impact initiative. So that there's kind of a wide array of, of ways that we support organizations from just helping them think through a problem to actually building them tools and, and kind of supplementing their staff um, as, the, as the sort of data person. And then third, something that we're building up is data fluency, right? So we can build all the tools in the world, but if people aren't comfortable coming and using them, and we need to build up that capacity, especially among the nonprofit sector where a lot of people like me who are social workers didn't learn this stuff in school and we're kind of picking it up on it, you know, as we go through our career. So I want to um, I can go to the next slide, please. I want to take a couple of minutes to go through like some quick tips because I feel like we should give you something kind of tangible to latch onto. 
Um, we're, we're, we're a data shop that always says like, let's take a chill pill on the data. You know, data is a flashlight. It gets you in the right direction. Um, and, and, and it'll help you kind of figure out what needs to be explored more deeply. But like the third point says, don't forget to talk to people. Don't forget to talk to organizations who are already working in these communities, people you can partner with. They're gonna know the stories and, and kind of the reasons why data looks the way it does. So it, it's, it's always those things in tandem. There's also the 2080 rule, which is something for me where I have to have some self-control to not just go down like really extensive wormholes. You can get about 80% of the answer from doing 20% of the work. And once you get that far, then maybe that's when you go talk to some people and kind of explore it and you know, uh, what direction to go from there. Um, you know, you can go to the next slide. Given, you know, we came up with, with this title, I think it was a clever one, uh, Communities Insight, Community Insights, Insight, Community Action. Came up with that back in April. We've had some significant kind of community changes uh, recently. Um, these aren't things that are new. We're just sort of newly, I guess, able and willing to talk about them. So we're in a moment where we have a public health crisis that is disproportionately affecting black lives. We have an economic crisis that's affecting uh, low income and families of color. And we're kind of collecting, collectively admitting that we have you know, some significant um, institutional racism and we're, we're finally able to talk about that. And so it's time to name that. And, and that's really hard to do with data or it actually, it, it sounds hard. Um, you know, if you're a health organization, looking at different health disparities is amazing and great and you have to do that. But we can go a step further and kind of look at the, the ways that all of our systems tie together. And so I'm going to, this is where I'm going to like leave the PowerPoint. I'm going to try to take it over and I'm going to try to demo something. This is also like a, a world premiere of our, our new tool. And I'm going to make a couple of maps real quick, but they're also in the slides that, that you'll, that you can download from the website. So one second to make sure it works. Here. All right, so from our website, and this is not a how-to video, I'm just showing you how quick and easy you can use some of these things. So this is our new tool, looks like a map. First thing it shows you is in counties and cities. I'm gonna get rid of those because for the sake of this example, I'm just gonna look at some Atlanta neighborhoods. I'm gonna knock down the thickness of those borders a little bit. I'm gonna add some data. And this is where we can look at a, lots of different community indicators to get a good sense of, of how these things interact with each other, right? So uh, let's go less than high school as an indicator. We just released this a few days ago. So pardon me on my slowness, it will get faster. Uh, there we go. Let's look at bachelor's degrees, uh, go here. And I'm just adding this data over here as we go. Both of those obviously are indicators of, of kind of educational uh, or education, which then kind of leads into uh, the, your job potential and your career and your income. Aubrey is pretty self-explanatory. Let's look at no vehicle. That's to do with mobility and access. If you need to get to a job, you know, and you don't have a car, you're pretty limited there. Same thing with broadband. If you don't have broadband internet, it's gonna be hard to look for a job or, or even to access um, uh, public benefits or, or even to like connect with other people. Look at vacant housing units, which is an indicator of public safety oftentimes. We'll look at disabilities real fast, just as a kind of general proxy for health. And then let's look at uh, race and see if there's a, if this pattern kind of flows into how the race is, right? So here we go. I'm gonna zoom in on Atlanta where hopefully this all works and comes together. All right, so this is looking at high school again. You can see a pretty clear divide. And, and the, the way that I picked indicators, I'm not worrying about this color scale being flipped or not. We're just gonna look for some, some patterns, right? So again, high school education, um, looking at bachelor's degrees, population and poverty. Okay, we're three maps in and you're starting to see a pattern. This is homes with no vehicles. 
internet access, vacant housing units, disabilities among adults, and this is uh, Atlanta's black population, right? So I'm going to X out of here. I don't know. Stop sharing. So that's kind of, that's of what, three minutes to kind of look at a handful of indicators that cut across sectors to pick up on patterns that, you know, it isn't because of race that those other things are true. Um, it is because of the policies and the decisions and the infrastructure. I mean, you can look at those maps and see the way that the highways are built and the way that communities have been displaced since the 50s in urban renewal. And it goes back further than that with redlining and everything. So you can kind of start to tell a story where data points you in that direction. Um, and so um, organizations like United Way and their Child Wellbeing Index kind of have, have built these indexes to kind of look at those holistically that helps target where services and investments go. And you see more and more organizations doing that. Um, so that's kind of how we work. That's how we think about data. We've been helping organizations kind of leverage that community data to then make decisions and, and kind of tell those local stories. And so um, uh, that is, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Cleo. Fascinating. Um, I want to remind everybody that we do have questions and answers that we intend to take from the group uh, for our panelists. Uh, if you'll just type them over to the right, we've got a couple. Uh, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask first, though, if I might. And um, Cleo, what what are some of the bigger implications of this type of research where you're really digging into the, the personal aspect beyond demographics? Where do you see this heading for us? Uh, I see this giving a better understanding of how people are doing um, more than what their age is, what their ethnicity is, et cetera. Um, so the data that we usually use to describe humans are things that they really can't change very well. Um, and this is something that we can use to describe humans that say, you know, how are you, how are you doing? Uh, is, do you have enough social support in your life? Is, are planners responding to your needs for meeting people in the built environment and for living outside of your home? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Tommy, I'm sure that these different layers of information that you've brought so neatly together here in this tool um, really invites uh, people to question the correlation between certain data sets. Uh, and I'm sure that, have you seen that activity going on? Are you getting that type of inquiry? Or, or do you anticipate uh, that to really spur on that type of um, question? And you're muted, Tommy. Sorry. I, I'm known on my team for just always being muted. Um, so the fact that we have so many different sources, and most of what I just showed you was from the ACS, um, which is one year and five year rolling averages, the American Community Survey. But when we start looking at, you know, if I had done census tracts, which I didn't do because it's a little slower to load, but we could pull in maternal data from the Department of Public Health, um, maternal health and, and, and infant health. Um, we could pull in, you know, various other, uh, we have all of the school data from the Department of Education with so many different sources all telling the same story and just layering them over and over and over, it's, it, it becomes very difficult to argue against, I think. So, so we're able to kind of tell this narrative. And I was at a very high level. I mean, look at the high, the, the high school um, degree or less, you actually see a pocket running up 85 and 316, especially around Norcross. I mean, you can dive deeper and look at um, you know, linguistic isolation and see that this is where um, communities are, are coming from other countries and, and you look at income there and, and then, then you go and look at what services are available. And we build a map for the Latino Community Fund to look at what human services even have someone, a volunteer or staff that speaks Spanish. Because you might say you serve everyone, but if you don't speak the language, you're not serving them, right? So it's, you know, it gives us a way to sort of dive in deep, find specific insights, broad insights, and then figure out, are we actually serving these communities? about to do the same thing with the mute. Well, and I think that that really calls into, and, and certainly for, for you and, and for folks that are watching, uh, sometimes I think uh, there can be quick correlates that are made where people say, let's say that we have uh, a lot of ice cream is eaten in this area of town. There are also a lot of car crashes. Eating ice cream causes car crashes. So I think there's some discipline that you bring to this in trying to really get to the root of that. 
Well, we've got three questions so far, and I invite our uh, our folks to please submit those while we have these great folks with us. Uh, and this is from Dr. Cliff Lipskin, who I think was a previous presenter here and a friend of mine. Uh, Cleo, I think it would be very interesting to overlay social capital data with real estate data. Do you know anyone who is working on this? Yeah, so I've pulled a couple of references from academic work that I'll, when I format them, I'll be happy to send them over or paste them. Mostly this has been looked at in terms of urban form and walkability and distance to POIs. I don't know of any that have done real estate specifically, but it sounds like an interesting approach. Excellent. Tommy, uh, Lee has asked, and, and she made a, a comment on the chat. I think she's a Pittsburgh fan and resident perhaps. Uh, she'd love if you could briefly demo Pittsburgh uh, with your tool. So our tool is for Georgia specifically. Uh, when we're pulling in data, we're doing it for the state of Georgia. Um, but I, I just also commented, one of our national partners is actually the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center housed at Pitt. Um, so um, Bob Gradek, who is the executive director there, I can make the introduction. He is a housing data expert. So um, and he's in your city. Excellent. Well, let's help the country catch up with us. How about that? Uh, uh, and then we have a, another question uh, for Cleo. Uh, collecting social capital or relationship data is tapping into some very private space of individuals, which may be the reasons that such data is not widely available yet. And he has two questions. How should researchers strike a balance in this case? And what may be some ethical ways to collect data? All of the data sets that I presented here, uh, social capital wise, were we're, um, we're gathered with a lot of those protections and ethical things in place because they are collected by governments mostly. So they use the same kind of protections as they do with demographic data for those types of data. Um, regarding the data on types of relationships, we usually don't use any personal names or, you know, where did you travel from to come to this POI? Where do you live, et cetera? It's mostly just to support, it's mostly just to support that type of relationship. So we just know that there are coworkers here. We don't necessarily know your name, how, what company you work for, et cetera. There are some technologies that I'm aware of that videotape um, public spaces and they sit and they try to extract what kinds of relationships are going on. Like, do you see intimacy involved in a conversation? Are there elderly people there? Are there only males sitting with males? What's going on there? And that types of thing is this very slippery slope. Um, but in terms of what we're collecting now, uh, there is a good level of, um, of anonymity associated with that. It's a good question. Okay. I'd also like to point out one thing from the the chat. Speaking of Pittsburgh, I think we have a we might have a question in the chat or two. Um, the zoo in Pittsburgh is amazing. Uh, that that specific uh, that specific study was just for restaurants. So maybe there were restaurants located near the zoo. And the, Excellent. The romance one was at the top of uh, Mount Washington, where there's the overviews of the city. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have another question, uh, Tommy. Uh, you indicated you're working on your data fluency offerings. What will that include if you do not mind sharing? Yeah, well, uh, we're trying to figure that out. So I would start with, um, what do you need? I'm gonna copy and paste your email from your comment. And then, um, you know, right now we're starting with things like this, where we just talk about stuff and see what sticks and what works. Um, we've partnered with uh, Georgia State. They have a, a, a data science for public service um, kind of meetup, which uh, has been kind of a little bit interrupted recently. Um, but yeah, we're just talking to a lot of people, trying to design stuff, um, working on putting together some FAQs, um, making some like downloadable PDFs. I mean, really our goal is to take data, which feels uh, stressful, overwhelming, um, and, and I don't know, <laughs> it makes people exhausted thinking about data. And we're just trying to make it actionable and a little more easy to kind of process and use. Um, so that's that's the goal. Um, and what that looks like will probably be a lot of things, but yeah, let's talk. Thank you, Tommy. 
Nisha writes, Cleo, great presentation. What is the latest on relationship and loneliness, happiness, friendliness data and COVID to provide guidance on how to better target interventions for disease outbreaks? Uh, insight. Nisha, that, that's a really great question. Um, I'm just going to read it again here. Guidance on how to better target enter interventions for disease outbreaks. Um, great question. So there are a couple of things that you can use. Mostly the network data is really important for the intervention aspect. Uh, the knowing where your com where your communities are and mo mobility is actually a really important thing for the disease outbreak. Um, in terms of loneliness, having this uh, friendliness, I'm sure that you could actually answer this question better than I could. Um, but knowing, I think that some people are saying that they're reaching their limit of social isolation and they're going out to restaurants. They're just doing these things. And so knowing a little bit more of the psychology behind that would be would be valuable. But again, I, I know you have a better answer to that question than I do. <laughs> okay, uh, Philip asked, uh, and, and this is true for me as well, y'all kind of covered some what's possible and some data sets that were pretty intriguing. And he would like to know, what are some of the implications of social capital for housing policy? Um, we stop short of going further once we get into demographic data. So that, um, that can be for either or both. I'll, I'll say two things. Uh, one, it would be, it would be good for housing policy to take into account if you are going to help somebody find housing, it would be good to take into account where their social capital is. Uh, so not necessarily just distance to a job or this neighborhood has availability, but how close can you be to the people who can volunteer to watch your kid? How close can you be to a relative? How close can you be to a household that you that helps you with food security if you need it? So taking into account you know, being close to people that help you can be something to be added to that process. Another correlate to that is that if you are, let's say you're recovering or you, you're in, in some sort of recovery or you were known to be susceptible to being pulled into networks of crime or something like that, knowing where that sort of turf is and where that maybe those behaviors are located, it might be good to know that and putting somebody in a place where they don't necessarily, um, they won't be in that environment anymore. But that involves a lot of normative values and they need to be approached very carefully. Tommy, do you have a comment on that? I would, I would maybe point to the Atlanta Regional Commission's uh, work on uh, affordable housing strategies for their region. Um, so there's uh, metroatohousing.org. And, and, and the way I might think about that with uh, the social connectedness is then to take um, data and, and research that uh, people like Cleo have done and sort of overlay those and look. And I, and I bet you'll find some patterns on, on what the different submarkets look like based on kind of who lives in those areas. Um, so I might take those two resources and try to, you know, find some correlation. Um, and then with that, you might be able to find, you know, come up with some maybe interventions or whatever you're trying to, whatever you're trying to create with that. Well, I know, I know too uh, that uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, you know, their broad approach to this is uh, really a mixed income type approach. Uh, your data and, and really gleaning, you know, the effects of that um, I think would be very interesting. And really, you know, Athens, we have a population of 130,000, so very different from Atlanta. And that leads us into our next question from Holger Lowendorf uh, with the Georgia Municipal Association who asked a very uh, pointed question, I think, uh, for, for both presenters. Um, what are some of the data limitations when looking at Georgia's cities? I know there are, there are probably 530 plus cities across Georgia. Uh, this is Blaine talking. Uh, and he points out 75% of the cities in the state have a population below 5,000 uh, people. Uh, so what are some of the data limitations when you come into the cities uh, when you have a disparity of, of the population? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is just the slowness of the data, right? When you have small areas, you can't do the one-year updates with the American Community Survey or the census, right? So it's you get these five-year averages, and so you're not going to see the dramatic change over time. Not that, not that they're 
ever is dramatic change unless there is some sort of different policy or, or large migration or something. But um, so there's this slowness to, see, to picking up on the trend. Um, there's also probably, I would imagine, larger margins of error um, in, in only surveying some portions. I and mean, that's why the census is so important, especially for, for small areas. Um, uh, I know in our tool, we, you know, you can choose cities and it lights up every city. If you compare it to everyone, Atlanta just completely ruins the distribution. You have to kind of take it out because I mean, you get these different populations that kind of skew everything. Um, and, and then I imagine there's going to be cultural differences that just the, the way that people behave and interact and probably longer commutes. Um, I, don't, I don't know. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of different sort of social aspects to it. But I would say technically probably the slowness and, and the, the, the margin of error on the data. But we build a lot of tools for GMA. I think they're great. Cleo, any yeah, comment on that? I'll, I'll echo what Tommy says. I mean, it's a more intimate situation, and the people who are embedded in those communities probably know what's best for the communities more than you know a top-down type of thing. Well, and and Holger adds on conversely, what types of data would you like to see from smaller cities in the state, uh, given what you've just shared as far as the limitations? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of the state data, like public health data, is at the county level. So I would love to see smaller area um, uh, data that, that would be kind of helpful and insightful to see, especially in rural areas where there's, you know, hospitals are going away. So what, what, what kinds of things are our policies or our infrastructure as they change? What kind of implications is that having in, in different communities, especially ones that are kind of hard to study? You know, I imagine these are the same communities that are hard to count on the census maps. And so um, it's just... There is that, um, uh, yeah. It's, there's, there's, there are barriers that exist, and and yeah, we should we should talk about how to how to solve some of those. Okay. Uh, another question from M. McDowell. Hi, Cleo. What are your thoughts on tracking perceived resilience within communities? Is this being done? Um, it depends on how you define resilience. Uh, it's a great a great question. You know, we want to know how communities, how the sum is greater than, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, a couple of ways that that has been done before is looking at their, how they bounce back after a disaster or how they organize after a disaster and uh, what kinds of, what what happened afterwards. Were they able to get back to where they were before? And then uh, the other way is, you know, economic bounce back. You know, how did they, how did this community, how was it able to respond to the recession? Or how was it able to respond to some sort of local plant closure, factory closure, or something like that? Like, was there a lot of community organization? Did they have enough relationships with each other to get their voices heard? Were things demolished that they needed? And what kinds of external resources were they able to bring in? Uh, so those are some ways to that, um, that communities have been measured in terms of their resilience. And Zillow actually has, if you wanted to look at the big data aspect of it, you certainly don't have to, but they have the housing over time and you can see how it dips in the recession, which does feel like a long time ago now, and then how certain communities bounce back in terms of their uh, value per square foot and then some sort of decrease. So that is one way of also measuring resilience, but of course you can measure it just at you know who's coming to the um, who's coming to the civic engagement kind of meetings, et cetera. There's a lot of ways. Good question. Well, that was for Cleo. Tommy, do you have any any points on that one? Okay. Now, here's a new, here's another really good question, but and it's Tommy. It's directed to you. What is your experience with data clashing with preconceived notions held by someone looking at or hearing an explanation of the data? Um, I think it's two things immediately that are, I think, unrelated. One is that we can look at the data and have all the answers. And I, that's why we kind of iterate and reiterate data as a flashlight. It'll get you close. You know, there's people that come with really specific questions and we just don't have, we don't collect data asked in the same way that people come up with questions. And so I think people were surprised with as much data that exists in the world, though what they're asking, like there isn't a specific answer to. I think the second one, which is pretty unrelated to that, you know, there's something that I had to say at the end of making those maps that I don't really want to say, and it's that this is not a genetic thing. It is not, this is not black people uh, doing worse in their lives. This is, uh, has to, which is what people have asked us afterwards. Like, oh, 
I'm not sure it's racism. I think it's just people um, are making bad decisions. But you can look historically, like it is the way it is because of structural they make decisions that have been made historically for hundreds of years, right? And so that that kind of that's one of those things that we feel like we have to kind of add that to the presentation, even though it, it, I wish it were more self-evident as we make like dozens of maps over and over. And that, that's what comes to mind first. Okay, Cleo, do you have anything you want to offer with any experience you've had with that? Okay, all right, Holger writes back. Um, he points out that there's a connection between your presentation and Klinenberg's Palaces for the People. How interested are you in mapping Georgia's social infrastructure at the local level, which has taken on added relevance due to the pandemic and debates about inclusion and equity? So how interested are you in mapping Georgia's social infrastructure at the local level? Yeah, very interested. We definitely want to do that. And I guess go, go ahead, Tommy. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Together. Well, I think um, some very insightful uh, data sets here that you've talked about. And one thing I would like to ask: there, there, I, I, you know, we've got a good number of folks with us today, and these are aimed at a mixture of uh, researchers and practitioners. And and I know from a local government standpoint, um, we're really trying to get local governments more engaged at, at their level. Uh, with data sets and, you know, mapping what's going on and understanding, um, you know, what can they be doing right now to sort of latch on to some these these things beyond the American Community Survey and demographics? How can they access some of this big data and make it bring some meaning to just the everyday GIS work they're doing? Me first. Um, yes, please. yeah, that, sorry. That's, that's a great question. It involves the big data research involves a lot of creativity and it involves knowing what you want to know. Otherwise, you're going to get very, very lost in the data. You know, you can download mobility traces for your community to see where, you know, where people are going. But if you don't have an idea in mind of what you think you're, you want to see or a specific question, it is so easy to get lost. Um, like if you want to know, hey, are people using the community center? Are people using this infrastructure? There's definitely ways to do that through big and small data, but it needs it. It's best if it's targeted. Um, so that would be my recommendation there. Okay, Tommy, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think for organizations, the same the, the same thing Cleo said. It's so easy to get lost and, and to think about data as big data, but really for me, it's I'm always thinking. Just go back to your strategic plan. What are the goals you're trying to accomplish? Or go back to your evaluation plan. Or um, think about the programs you offer and, and what decisions are you making to improve those and to grow your organization. And think about the, and use data that's going to help you make decisions, not just um, looking at it to look at it. That's fun. But when we're, when we're trying to actually kind of like make critical decisions, it's you know look at your evaluation data internally. How do you marry that or how does that reflect the community that you're serving? Um, maybe it's looking at just basic demographics of who you're serving and, and who lives in your community and or, or looking at your board of directors and saying, does that reflect who we're serving? So it's a lot of times it's like it's not that difficult. It's just one or two indicators can get you the answer. Um, sometimes it's more complicated if you're doing something a little more robust and you can make yourself a little index of, you know, six or seven indicators. Um, yeah. I work with the group last. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that what you're saying is so spot on. Please continue. Thanks. <laughs> um, I worked with a group last year that was um, trying to place a, a thrift store in their part of town. And, and really what that was is taking six or seven indicators, uh, figuring out or, or realizing or just illustrating like, you know, the north side of this town uh, is out in Covington. Uh, the north side of town is kind of where new development and more buying power is. The south side of town is where the need is. So let's put the service center in the south side and put your thrift store in the north side so we can raise some more money to feed it back into your service center. It's, it's, it's relatively intuitive. It's just having that data that answers your questions or it gives you that kind of confidence to make the decisions. Yeah, it's, that's, I wanted to say that's so spot on. And I think having confidence in your questions, some people are like, you know, I'm not really sure if I'm asking the right question, et cetera. Let's just download all the data, look at it, see what we find. You know about your communities so well. You know about the problems that are there. You know about the nuanced things. Use that data to support your good 
um, intuition to support your good intuition. Looking at the data to be like, oh, you know, maybe we missed something. Let's just, that's okay, but it's not, it's, you're gonna, it's gonna be problematic. I would have confidence in your own knowledge of your community. Well, and I think in the spirit of the, the this webinar uh, series, we wanna marry that intuition of the local uh, understanding with the research that you two and others are helping to further. And I think, um, to your points both, uh, that we wrestle with this uh, new understanding of equity and inclusion. I think we can really be guided by the research and the understanding of the data sets that maybe in smaller communities they need to be looking at to tie with their, lo their, their local intuition. Dr. Andrus, uh, Tommy, I appreciate your time today. Uh, this has been excellent, and everyone that's joined us, uh, I hope that you, uh, thank you for your insightful questions, and I hope that you continue to stay in tune to this webinar, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. I really want to thank Cleo and Tommy and Blaine for a very engaging discussion on data and the impacts on, on the communities. Uh, a lot of great uh, websites now that I think are, are available for everyone to check out and, and play with the data. I hope you do. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that this is the last webinar in our series for the spring. We're going to take a two-month break during the summer and come back in September where we hear from our Georgia Smart Communities Challenge teams uh, and then go into the fall session. So thank you again for attending and we'll be on break for a little while this summer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.